was true in the United States is true in every country. Trickle-down economics does not work. We do need to continue with investment, and that will take a bit of time. It'll take more time. Innovation solves problems. We had a lot of problems through the coronavirus. Innovation solves problems. We were rewarded accordingly. This is Bloomberg Surveillance, early edition with Francine Lacqua. Well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition on this Thursday, the 9th of June. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London, and here's what's coming up on today's program. Countdown to liftoff. The ECB will pave the way for its first rate hike in over a decade as it seeks to tame record inflation, and we're live in Amsterdam. Silence fuels the speculation. State Street slides after refusing to comment on a report that it made by Credit Suisse. The chief executive, Gottstein, will speak at 10 a.m. UK time. Plus, stay tuned for this hour. We'll be joined by Nanette heschler feiderb and Frédéric Ducrozet to talk ECB. Plus, the former UK Chancellor, Philip Hammond, and Tate and Lyle's chief executive, Nick Hampton, will all discuss British politics and inflation. If you have any questions for any of our guests, write into IB Plus TV Go. Now, first thing is first, to always check on the markets. And actually, we're seeing a little bit of anxiousness out there when it comes to markets. I think we have a cross-board asset check. But first, let's start with some of the maps. The FTSE the CAC 40, the FTSE MIB over in Italy and the DAX down between six tenths and eight tenths of eight percent. Of course, the pressure is still man markets trying to figure out monetary policy normalization, what that means for inflation, therefore what it means for risky assets. And then the other thing we're looking out for is, of course, China. We did have some encouraging data uh, to say that exports are rising as they get out of lockdown, but then certain parts of certain cities will also be closed on Saturday for testing, and so a little bit of a wait and see situation over in China. Now, armed with new forecasts and with prices rising at a record pace, ECB President Christine Lagarde and her colleagues look set to end trillions of euros of asset purchases. They're expected to lay a path to exiting eight years of negative interest rates at today's monetary policy meeting. While well, we spoke to the ECB president two weeks ago in Davos, she said the bank is not acting reactively. We are not in a, in a, a panic mode. And we've started that journey, thinking about it very carefully, back in December, with steps along the way. And we are now at a stage where there is um, every certainty that we will stop net asset purchases uh, very early in uh, in July. Let's get more now on this with our Europe correspondent Maria today, who's in Amsterdam for that meeting. Maria, there's a sequencing. The ECB clearly put out exactly what they want to do, but then the market, and certainly it's priced into the money markets, they're expecting a 50 basis point hike, possibly in July and then September. Will Christine Lagarde push back against that? Yes, she did. And Francine, I remember that interview, of course, that you did in Davos, uh, that big exclusive in which she told you repeatedly, we're not in a panic mode, we're not behind the curve, and she really defended the actions of the ECB. But if you look at the market and a number of calls now increasing, I should say, a number of calls from a number of major banks now do say that the European Central Bank does look behind the curve and is going to have to be uh, more aggressive in July. So to me, the focus today, knowing, of course, that she will finally make it official as her purchases will come to an end in the next few weeks, and of course, that now opens the way for the first uh, rate hike. The really the debate is: Is she going to stick with that 25% basis points narrative? We have a hold on this, or actually now hint at a more hawkish stance from the European Central Bank. Of course, very much tied uh, to this, Francine, is the language around the fragmentation and potentially the spillover from this normalization. The more you rate, high, you rate or increase rates, excuse me, you could see that volatility feed in into the bond market. We've been seeing it lately with BTPs. Is she going to give a clear clear signal now that the European Central Bank is ready to provide some buffer to that for that central bank and potentially tailor policy for 19 different economies. So I think a lot of this will depend on the language around the rate path that we go from here. Is it more hawkish or not? And then to the fragmentation that really is a buzzword in markets today. Yeah, and that, of course, is something that she'll have to navigate during the press conference, Maria. Yeah, and you know, Francine, it's always uh, difficult, and we always say this, uh, I get the impression we, we always focus more on the press conference than, in fact, the statement itself. But the language today will be key, whether she can match the expectations of the market, whether she can be in tune uh, with what's already priced in, but also give clear signals on those two very important topics. Are we heading for 25? Now, maybe open to 50, but also two, what happens if we start seeing persistent jitters in the bond market, particularly, of course, in the periphery? 
Maria, thanks so much. Our Europe correspondent Maria Tadeo there in Amsterdam where the ECB meeting is today. Now let's bring in Annette heschler Feiderb, Chief Investment Officer, International Wealth Management and Global Head of Economic Research at Credit Suisse. Nanette, thank you for joining us. <clears throat> so much is being priced in on what the ECB can do in terms of aggressiveness. Do you think the hawks have taken hold at the governing council? Well, it's a, it's a close call. Uh, our base case is that uh, the ECB is going to stick to those 25 basis points paths that they have led out. But today, we are going to very carefully look at the verbal guidance, in particular, whether they're going to drop their, uh, their uh, sentence that interest rate hikes will be gradual. So that will be a cue for us on to what to expect for Jul July. We will also pay a lot of attention to the long term term inflation expectations, if they are around 2.3 to 2.4 percent, as opposed to uh, closer to 2 percent, then this is a hawkish cue as well. And as you also pointed out, the fragmentation tool and more uh, on that uh, may be actually also an indication that they're preparing to uh, front load some of those in future interest rate hikes into July. So today, very important so to look at the verbal guidance. So, and the verbal guidance, I think, is probably what, you know, makes a lot of institutional investors, a lot of governments in Europe very nervous about what she could say on fragmentation. If we don't have some kind of support for your periphery bond yields, what does it mean for markets? For sure, um, when to expect a, a, a faster interest rate hike uh, path, then also this is likely to feed into credit spreads. And so uh, markets are going to, to react to that, uh, whether there is a mitigation uh, tool that is going to be um, implemented in order to contain uh, some of those spillovers into the credit market. Yeah, and Annette, I mean, really, for me, the, the chart of the day, and then I'll ask you about treasuries at 3%, is really the spread between Italy and Spain and what, of course, that means going forward. Where do you find value? Where do you find bargains in Europe right now? I mean, beyond Europe, I, I have to say just simply the higher yield environment that we are seeing in global bonds now uh, across the board, starting in the U.S. Uh, with, you know, back to, to 3% in 10-year nominals uh, for, for government bonds, but also in Europe now, much faster increase in bond yields. Uh, all of that is giving us actually, a, 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 you know, just a better even base to, to look at uh, many segments of fixed income. So uh, we, I have to say, have uh, been a, of the view that in the emerging market, hard currency uh, bonds, if you're asking me concretely, where do I see opportunities that are arising thanks to benchmark yields that are higher? It is in these areas there we already see some very attractive yields in, in our view. But also, I think there is now the case to be more neutral rather than uh, underweight in, um, in, in government bonds as well. Just simply because of the higher yield level that we are seeing. Um, Nanette, I mean, there has been a, a pretty dramatic shift in markets overall as how they're pricing risk around the world. Do you think worldwide there still needs to be more correction to, pr to price in possible recessions, to price in this, you know, possible stagflation environment for longer? Really, I mean, the way I've been thinking about markets is, is uh, in a sequence of things. The market so far has really repriced interest rate levels, and especially what equities have done. And those equities that are particularly sensitive to interest rates, in my view, has, has been really reconfirming that, uh, that, that interpretation of what has happened on the market. The next phase is going to be on how the market is anticipating now the effects of uh, tighter monetary conditions, higher interest rates on the economy. Uh, the UK, whether it's in the housing market, whether it's on private consumption, whether it's altogether on GDP expectations, a very good example in case. And that's going to be the second phase that markets will, will be looking at. So cyclical sectors will, will probably have to uh, be reassessed against uh, the expectation that economies are going to get cooled over time. 
Uh, it brings us back to watching quality earnings, to watching companies that have good pricing power, to watching where there is value also in the valuations. At the moment, we think, for example, there is a very good case to be made for China equities. Uh, but right. uh, over time, there will be other opportunities arising. Uh, Nanette, what are you expecting actually Treasury yields to do? And again, have I guess has the fallout of Treasury yields at 3% and above been already hitting the markets? Oh, I think um, those yields in 10-year in U.S. Treasuries are probably going to continue rising a little bit, but at a much slower pace and in really not in the same magnitude as before. So just concretely over the next 12 months, I could see very well uh, the 3.4, 3.5% type of, of level there for 10-year uh, nominal U.S. Treasury yields. Uh, but um, what it tells you already is that at those higher levels where we are now and with much slower uh, further increases, uh, just total returns on U.S. Treasuries uh, are going not to look as, as bad anymore as a few months ago. Uh, so I do expect that uh, a number of investors are going to see this uh, push above the 3% level that we are starting now as also a possibility to rebalance balance their allocations a little bit, uh, a bit more in favor of fixed income as before. Nanette, thank you so much. As always, Nanette Heschler, Fider of the Chief Investment Officer, International Wealth Management and Global Head of Economic Research at Credit Suisse, joining us this morning. Now, coming up on the program, we'll continue the conversation on the ECB with Frédéric Ducrozet. He's Head of Macroeconomic Research at Pictet Wealth Management. And then a little bit later on, we'll also be joined by the former UK Chancellor, Philip Hammond, to discuss the UK economy and what next for a divided Conservative Party. This is Bloomberg. Finance politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition and Francine Lacroix here in London. Now let's discuss more on the ECB with Frédéric Ducrozet, head of macroeconomic research at Pictet Wealth Management. First off, Frédéric, congratulations on the promotion, but also you're one of the smartest thinkers on the ECB. So um, don't, you know, always never forget the ECB and all of your research. What are you Thanks. expecting for, for Madame Lagarde to actually position what they'll do in July and beyond? Yeah, it's all about uh, guidance today. It's uh, been eight years since the, essentially the start of QE when Mario Draghi in Amsterdam eight years ago uh, announced and paved the way for QE. And now we're here back in Amsterdam with the governing council announcing the end of net asset purchases. So that's a given. What we will be all watching in the statement and during the press conference is the verbal uh, guidance for the pace of uh, policy normalization. The thing, uh, I think the difficulty today in terms of communication for Christine Lagarde is that just a few weeks ago, on the, on the 23rd of May, she did lay out the path for normalization with a, a rather gradual pace of 25 basis point hike. So we all appreciate the case now for a faster pace of uh, normalization, including 50 basis point hikes. It's difficult for her to completely switch from this gradualism to something much more aggressive. That's, I think, uh, the most yeah. uh, difficult challenge today. So, for like, how, how do you think she'll actually position that? And what are you expecting of the ECB? Because, the, you know, I, I guess things could then turn if we're looking at peak inflation now. I don't think they will pre-commit to uh, the exact size of uh, uh, timing and, and pace of uh, hikes uh, as of today. I think the statement will be open to potentially a faster pace of normalization should uh, they see a, a further deterioration in the inflation outlook. The staff projection will be very important. I think it will be the first time ever uh, that the ECB staff uh, will project uh, long-term inflation above 2%. That in itself is obviously a strong case for, you know, a swift exit, at least from negative rates. And then again, we have a couple of data that will be very important uh, before the uh, next meeting on the 21st of July, which is a the next HICD print, inflation and core inflation in particular. If we see a further increase, I think this will potentially tip the balance, and uh, inflation expectations. And the survey of professional forecaster from the ECB in particular, that may also be uh, potentially the ultimate piece of evidence that the ECB will seek to collect before they make a decision. But in my 
view uh, it's a very close call. I would say that on the margins, yeah. a 50 basis point hike is more likely for September than uh, in July. Let's not forget that July is also a bit tough in terms of liquidity conditions for BTP mm -hmm. spreads in particular. Uh, Frederick, I have to say the you know the history of Amsterdam and ECB with that 2014 speech of Mario Draghi talking about contingencies is not lost on anyone. Does, you know, will Madame Lagarde think of that and, and find and forge her way forward? You know, as, as she said uh, during uh, your interview in Davos, actually, uh, the ECB has been preparing for that, moving from gradualism, flexibility to something also slightly different, which is optionality. Optionality, and she could argue this today, means uh, both ways, uh, looking at risk in um, either directions, in, including in terms of hawkish surprises that we've had for several months now. And there is, again, I think a fundamental case for the ECB to move faster in the first step. But then the difficulty is that they need to come uh, with this uh, slightly change for the first step of the normalization, going back above zero, essentially, and yeah. mitigate yeah. that, I would say, by a more gradual push stone beyond uh, September, let's say, and moving towards neutral levels that, uh, to me, is a much more uh, difficult challenge to meet for this. Yeah. Uh, for the, do you think the ECB should come out with some kind of anti-fragmentation tool today? And is the time, is, is you know, sooner the better, or can they wait a couple of weeks and months? I think they will wait, really. Uh, I, um, I wouldn't hold my breath, and I don't think they will get much details about that. The first line of defense is the uh, PEPPD reinvestment. We know, uh, we know already, actually, it's not news uh, from this week's uh, um, story that uh, reinvestment can be brought forward in time, that can be spread uh, across regions. They can use that as a, a first tool. But when you look at BTP spreads, they're back below 200 basis points. They have, uh, more importantly, in my view, moved uh, in sync with your area IG credit spread. So it means that Italy is still perceived by investors as uh, interest rate risk. Everything has been repriced mm -hmm. higher, but not an idiosyncratic uh, credit risk which is a big difference for the ECB. And I think both the Oaks and the Doves will be willing to wait and uh, constructive mm -hmm. ambiguity will prevail or not. Apart from anti-fragmentation, is there anything else that the ECB can do in place to, to keep those bonds under control? I know it's something no one talks about, but they are still telcos. They are still liquidity operation. And when you look, you know, the ECB will uh, stop buying bonds in net terms at least. Next year, in the coming years, we have a big question mark in terms of fiscal policy, fiscal rules. Who else can meet this demand for sovereign bonds? Well, uh, the private sector, banks in particular, and uh, liquidity tools having part of this uh, uh, toolkit from the ECB. We're not talking about this at the moment, but if and when banks start to repay those telcos, this will, I think, add to the risk also in terms of demand, lower demand in that case, uh, for uh, sovereign bonds. And that could be also part of the solution. But overall, mm. again, I think they will wait for uh, spreads to move meaningfully higher and wider before they make any decision. Frédéric, thank you so much. Smart conversations and, of course, research notes. As always, Frédéric Ducrozet, their head of macroeconomic research at Pictet Wealth Management. Now, coming up, who is behind Elon Musk's Twitter offer? Up next, a secretive $5 billion fund that is pledging the third largest amount to Musk's bid. That's coming up next, and this is Bloomberg. Finance politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lanco here in London. Now, who are the people behind Elon Musk's bid for Twitter? Well, as well as the bevy of big name bankers and Silicon Valley mainstays, there's a notable exception. Yes, it is the third largest investor, and he's secretive, the secretive Alexander Tamas, and not that secretive, but as a personality, we don't know much about him. He runs Vi Capital. Its website consists of a little more than one page with no address or contact details, but its assets under management have recently 
balloon to more than $5 billion. And if he's watching, we would love to interview you. But here with the very latest on this is our Bloomberg Daybreak Europe anchor, Danny Berger. She tracks all these secretive billionaires. <laughs> what do we know about him? Yeah, so so to your point, not, not a lot, which of course is interesting within itself because it's just such not only a huge deal, but a very public deal. So we know that he, part of his career started out working for tech deals at Goldman. He then uh, went on to work with the uh, Russian-Israeli uh, billionaire Yuri Milner. Um, from there, he eventually founds his own fund. We know it's grown a lot recently, uh, doubling the size from a 2020 um, statement that said it was around $2 billion. Um, and we know that he's also been cultivating ties with Elon Musk. He has put money into the Boring Co., uh, SpaceX, Neuralink. We also know that one of his um, interns is actually the son of a key aide to Elon Musk. Okay. So he has connections there. So there's definitely connections. What do we know about the bid? So apparently you now Twitter's complying. They're yeah. going to give him the data. Like, d does Twitter want to be sold now? Well, it seems like Twitter's doing everything they can to be sold, to get Elon Musk to live up to this contract. It was a report from Washington Post and New York Times saying they've unleashed the fire hose. They're going to give Elon Musk 500 million tweets each day that come out to sort through the data. That is quite the headache to uh, sort through. But, you know, it might make him have to comply with this deal. Have to comply. What a fun story. Danny Berger, there are our anchor for Bloomberg Daybreak Europe. Coming up in the week that Boris Johnson narrowly survived the confidence vote, we speak to the former UK Chancellor, Philip Hammond. That interview is next. And this is Bloomberg. Down to lift off what well, the ECB will pave the way today for its first rate hike in over a decade as it seeks to tame record inflation. We're live in Amsterdam. Silence fuels the speculation State Street slides after refusing to comment on a report that made by Credit Suisse. The chief executive Gottstein will speak at 10 a.m. UK time. Plus, stay tuned. This hour, the former UK Chancellor Philip Hammond and Tate Lyle, chief executive Nick Hampton, will discuss British politics and inflation. Any questions for our guests, write in on IB Plus TV Go. So good morning, everyone, and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition for our audience on TV and radio. I'm Francine Lacqua here in London. Now, Boris Johnson will promise to reform the UK housing market today as he attempts to heal his fractured Conservative Party in his first big policy speech since narrowly winning a vote on his leadership. Well, we're delighted now to be joined by Philip Hammond, Lord Hammond, former UK Chancellor of the Exchequer. What a week to speak to you, Lord Hammond. I mean, I feel like everything and everything's happened all at once. Can Boris Johnson survive this for, for the next year? Will he still be Prime Minister in 2023? Uh, well, I can't say whether he'll be prime minister going into 2023, but I don't think that he will lead the party into the next general election. I think uh, um, a rebellion on this scale is very difficult uh, to survive, and I think he'll find that his authority uh, in the party uh, ebbs away over the next few months. D does he realise, and will it change the policies that he'll put in place? I don't know whether he realizes, but I know that Boris Johnson's um, instinct now will be to reach for popular policies, do the populist thing, uh, and try to offer people what in the short term they think they want. Unfortunately, we're at a point in our economic cycle where what we need is a dose of realism. Um, we have some challenges in this country to face. The sooner we get to grips with them and, and face them honestly and openly, uh, the quicker we'll get out of them and the better chance we've got of resuming uh, a strong growth path and rebuilding living standards. But so 40% so of his own MPs in the Conservative Party voted against him. Why are they against him? I mean, this is, not, this is not necessarily about Partygate. No, I think it's deeper than that. I think it's, um, and, and to, to be honest, my, my colleagues are very focused once you get to the tipping point in a parliament, the second half of a parliament heading towards the next general election, very focused on the question of whether we can win the next election, whether they can hold on to their seats and their jobs. Uh, and I think the verdict is that um, Boris Johnson is no longer, uh, on balance, a vote winner for the Conservative Party. He's potentially a vote loser. Uh, and I think um, the message is, is, is seeping through that the party needs to change direction. And for anybody taking over the leadership of the party, to be able to rebuild trust with the British people is going to take some time. It's no good doing this six, nine months before a general election. It's going to have to be done 
sooner rather than later. Why do they think he's a vote loser? Uh, the evidence around them, the polling evidence, and we'll see uh, you know, evidence in by-elections um, over the coming weeks. Do, do you think he should resign? Well, um, it's a bit academic, really. That isn't um, in the nature of prime ministers, and I'm not at all surprised that the prime minister's position is that he's won the vote, and even if he'd won it by a single vote, he will soldier on. Um, that was also Theresa May's position after she won a confidence vote um, in 2018, but the writing was on the wall uh, from that point onwards. Authority just uh, quietly drains away. It doesn't happen overnight. It's a cumulative um, effect, um, and I think we'll see a drip feed of, uh, unfortunately, bad news around the UK economy over the coming um, months that is going to make it much, much more difficult for the Prime Minister. But can you draw real parallels between Theresa May and what's happening to, to Boris Johnson? Or because the personalities are so widely different, Boris Johnson will also deal with it differently? He will deal with it differently, but I think the other big difference is that, of course, Theresa May had no overall majority in Parliament and was therefore immediately vulnerable to defeats in Parliament. Boris is much less vulnerable to defeats in Parliament because of the size of the Conservative majority, although clearly if even um, a half of the people uh, who uh, voted against him on Monday were to vote against um, the Tory whip in the Commons, uh, the government would be badly defeated. But that, that's probably not the way it's going to happen. I think this is probably going to be about a slow attrition of authority over the course of the summer and into the autumn. Um, so, so, Lord Hammond, talk to me a little bit about how it works in your Conservative Party. Are there, you know, behind the scenes conversations now about who could replace him? Are they coalescing behind the candidate or is it still all out in the open? No, well, I don't, I don't think they are coalescing behind the candidate and that, of course, is part of the problem for the rebels and part of the um, good fortune of the Prime Minister that there is not an obvious successor. Wind the clock back uh, six months and Rishi Sunak looked like the obvious inheritor building a very strong position but he has been damaged by the um, perhaps unfairly but he has nonetheless been damaged uh, by the uh, issues around his wife's tax status and I think just by um, you know at a time of cost of living crisis people being reminded that he comes from a very different um, set of circumstances from most of them so I think, you know, most of my former colleagues in Parliament do not regard Rishi Sunak as being um, the likely front-runner yeah. in an early competition. If it, if it goes long, he may have a chance to rebuild um, his position. So, so who is the front-runner? I mean, we hear about well, Jimmy I, I, Hunt, I, I, Liz Truss. I, yeah, well, all of, these, all of these people will definitely be runners um, in the race. And, um, you know, Nadim Zahawi, Tom Tugendhat, the people who are spoken about very often, um, among colleagues. I mean, they all have strengths, they all have weaknesses uh, as well, and there will be a lot of jockeying for position over the coming um, weeks. The, the, the exquisite dilemma for cabinet ministers now um, is how to position themselves. Um, nobody who's in the cabinet um, wants to immediately put themselves offside with the prime minister, yeah. but every single one of them however strongly they're professing their undying loyalty, yeah. is privately thinking about when is the moment to make their move to distance themselves from the Prime Minister if he's ultimately going down and positioning themselves either to be a runner yeah. or at least to have a role in the cabinet of a future leader. But th this is extremely difficult because, you know, as opposed to your boss, Theresa May, it seems like Boris Johnson will not tolerate any dissent. So that's, that is another big difference. Theresa's response to um, uh, the vote of confidence was to try and build a broader coalition, to try and reach out to people within the party who she thought were at least amenable to reason and, and, to, try, and to try to be conciliatory. Um, uh, Boris, I think, will take the opposite approach. Um, certainly my experience with Boris was that um, he takes a very extreme view of anyone who challenges him personally uh, and if he can find out who the 148 are I'm certain that their <laughs> prospects will be very limited over the remaining um, period of his tenure in office. How many of the 148 you think also voted against him because of what's happening in tax and the fact that I, I mean I was told um, in a private conversation by a big large party donor that this is not a conservative government just because of the tax increases. So there is definitely a mood among a lot of traditional conservatives 
that this is the, the government's policies are not truly conservative um, policies, that it's far more interventionist, far more big government than they would like to see, far, far higher taxing mm -hmm. government than they would like to see. But of course what the Prime Minister is trying to do is manage the coalition that he built yeah. in 2019, which is, was never going to be a sustainable coalition. On the one hand, traditional Conservatives who want to see smaller government, lower taxes. On the other hand, the new Tories, if you like, in the red wall seats, who've been promised um, lots of spending on infrastructure and levelling up, who've implicitly been promised higher wages um, for themselves. They want to see a bigger, more activist government spending more money right. and taxing more, so long as it's taxing somebody else more. Of course, no, nobody's in favour of more tax if it falls on themselves. Um, but there's definitely a constituency out there that the Prime Minister does have to think about yep. who would like to see more taxes on other people in order to fund their priorities. And then where's Labour in all of this? So should they be doing better? Should, yeah, they should certainly they should. So, so why aren't they? So the other great um, advantage Boris Johnson has uh, is frankly a very poor uh, exploitation by the Labour Party of his difficulties over the last, yep. um, uh, the last months. Uh, it, it really is or has been an open goal and they failed to kick the ball into it. All right, Lord Hammond, thanks so much. A former UK Chancellor of the Exchequer, he actually stays with us and we'll talk about crypto next. To cryptocurrencies with former UK Chancellor Philip Hammond. That's next, and this is Bloomberg. Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now let's get straight to your Bloomberg Business Flash. Here's Leanne Gerrans. Hi, Leanne. Hi, Francine. European gas prices have gained this morning after a fire broke out at a Texas export terminal. The incident threatens to leave gas supplies stranded in the domestic American market despite strong overseas demand. Owner Freeport LNG says the blaze has been brought under control and there were no injuries. The facility is one of seven terminals that exports U.S. natural gas by sea. Apple is to handle its own lending for a new buy now pay later offering. A wholly owned subsidiary will oversee credit checks and make decisions on loans for the servers, which is called Apple Pay Later. The move sidesets partners and the tech giant pushes deeper into financial services. Uber CEO says the company is recession restrained. In an interview at the Bloomberg Technology Summit, Dara Kushra Shahi said spending on services has remained robust and the ride hailer's supply of drivers is up almost. 80% on a year ago. He also said he doesn't see any need for job cuts. We don't think they're necessary at all. However, with the uncertain environment out there, we should be more cautious. You know, there's much more uncertainty as you look forward six to 12 months. Uh, and my message to our employee bases, we're going to be careful. We feel really good about the business and the trends, but let's not get carried away. And that's your Bloomberg Business Flash, Francine. Yeah, thank you so much. Now, I want to go back to UK politics with Lord Hammond, former Chancellor of the Exchequer, and then we'll talk about crypto because he did also uh, join an asset trading company, a Copper, last year. Uh, Lord Hammond, let, let's just go back to something that you told me in the break, which I find fascinating. So there was a vote with 148 rebels from Conservative MPs on Monday. You were telling me that if this vote happened yesterday, he would have lost it. Why? If the vote was run again yesterday, I think there would have been... Uh, significantly more people voting against him. I suspect that on Monday everybody was surprised by the outturn. Many uh, of my former colleagues would have voted for the Prime Minister with a uh, heavy heart, expecting him to win, not wanting to break cover at this stage. Knowing what they now know, that there are 148 um, rebels solidly against him, I think if the vote were rerun, uh, there would be certainly more than 148, possibly as many as 180 uh, that would vote against him. I mean, is it possible for him to even survive the summer, given what, you're, what you think? Well, I think it's going to be very difficult. As I've said, um, yeah. th it's pernicious. Uh, authority drains away once you get into this kind of position. 
Um, I also want to talk about cryptocurrencies because, sure. of course, you joined the London-based digital asset trading company Copper last year, and uh, you basically say that the UK has fallen behind other European hubs or in the European Union in setting clear regulation on the burgeoning crypto industry. So you want, Lord Hammond, the UK to become a global leader in digital asset technology. First of all, are we confusing stable coins? Bitcoin and and some digital assets that could be useful like what what's good and what's not So um, first of all copper the, 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 the company that I'm involved with is only involved in institutional uh, Trading it doesn't right. it doesn't so deal with Bitcoin. retail right. uh, customers at all and I'm agnostic on um, uh, <laughs> uh, Coins and and uh, the trading of coins what interests me is building the underlying infrastructure the uh, distributed ledger technology enabled infrastructure that will power the financial services of the future now at the moment that infrastructure is being used to trade um, uh, digital assets right. because they're the only uh, products capable of being traded but we're moving very rapidly towards an era when traditional financial uh -huh. assets will be tokenized and will be traded over the same platforms and the jurisdiction which has built that infrastructure most effectively will be will have a, a massive first yeah. mover advantage and that's not and the UK. I want that to be London but it's so, already too late uh, well I don't think it's too late but but we're really up against it look I, I wasn't as you know a great fan of leaving the European Union but we made that decision we've left the European Union and the big challenge for the UK one of the big challenges for the UK now is how we maintain <laughs> our role our dominance in financial services in the post-Brexit world, where we will not have, as of right, access to European no. um, Union markets. And one of the obvious ways to do that is to do what we've done in the past, is to embrace new technology quickly and effectively, use the agility of our regulators as a, an unfair advantage, if you like, and be a first mover. And we have not done that with crypto, and it's a great disappointment to me. So why? Do you think because, because they're scared to regulate it, because they don't have the right you know, staff to regulate it, because it's still quite complicated and open? So it is complex. I think there are two big reasons. One is that um, in the public's mind, um, the whole debate around crypto is mixed up with perceptions about the use of crypto assets in money laundering and organized crime and so on and the underlying value of building this digital infrastructure has not really been conveyed. And secondly, I think the regulators have been under incredible pressure. I mean, the UK regulators have had to deal with the consequences of Brexit, the temporary uh, permissions regimes inward and outward that they've been managing. They've had an enormous amount to do over the last couple of years, and I think they've struggled, frankly, to recruit and retain the right people and to provide the bandwidth to address the digital opportunity. Philip Hammond, as always, thank you so much for thank joining you. us. He's, of course, Lord Hammond, the former UK Chancellor of the Exchequer, joining us this morning. And you can hear more from Philip on crypto in the next episode of Bloomberg's In the City podcast. Actually, this week's podcast is really quite cool. It's on food in London. And the next week will be on crypto. Now, coming up, a sweet beat for Tate & Lyle. See what we've done there? It's full year net income comes in better than estimates. We'll dive into the results with the company's chief executive officer, Nick Hampton. That's coming up next. And this is Bloomberg. Finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Francine Lacroix here in London. Now, China, we understand, is considering uh, reviving Jack Ma's anti PO as crackdown eases. Yesterday, we had a number, of course, of gaming companies, but also uh, financial companies benefiting from an understanding that actually China is easing some of the restrictions that we saw in the last couple of years when it comes to cracking down. So we'll have, of course, a very close eye on that, and we'll keep an eye on also Alibaba getting 4%. 
4% turning positive in U.S. pre-market trade. Now, on to Tate & Lyle, reporting better-than-expected earnings for your net income came in at £236 million, down nearly 7% year-on-year. For the coming year, the UK-based food and beverage ingredient maker sees its revenue growing further. Now, we're now joined by Tate & Lyle's Chief Executive Officer, Nick Hampton. Nick, thank you so much for joining us. Now, of course, a reminder to everyone, you no longer do the sugars. It's the sweeteners, the things that people want, especially when we're calorie counting or trying to be more healthy. Talk to me about inflation. How much is the refining process, but also the, the inflation pressure on you, and are you able to pass it on to consumers? So, I mean, clearly inflation is a significant factor, uh, as it was last year, by, by the way. And, you know, the way we're dealing with that is uh, through significant productivity. So last year we hit a $150 million productivity target two years ahead of, of target. Um, cost control, so being disciplined in the business, and where necessary, passing through pricing to customers. Now, for us, although the functionality of our ingredients is really important to our customers' products, it's actually a relatively small part of the overall cost of the product, and therefore the impact on consumers is is pretty small compared to some other raw materials that go into, yeah. into food products. So that helps us with, um, with pricing. But, but in, in terms of some of the raw materials, you're, for example, very exposed to, to corn because of the shortages from either drought or also what's happening in Ukraine. I imagine it's much more difficult not only to source but also to get it to where you need it to be. So we're working hard to maintain security for supply. We've got forward cover on our key raw materials, corn, etc., for the next six months or so. And we're fortunate that we don't source anything out of Ukraine or Russia. But as you say, it's a dynamic environment. So we're having to work hard to keep the factories running and keep our customers served. No, not, no, not really significantly no. different to what we saw through the pandemic. And we did it successfully then. But it's a continual focus for our team on a daily basis to make sure we've got security of supply and we can keep moving products because yeah. transport's in short supply as well. So where do you see the biggest pain points will be in soft commodities and when will we get back to a more normal scenario? Well, it's, it's no doubt that the, the challenge is, is greater in Europe than it is in the rest of the world because of the terrible situation in, in, in Ukraine. Um, in, terms of, in terms of forward view of inflation, we're planning for continued inflation for the foreseeable future. So, you know, we're, we're, we're managing our business, assuming inflation will continue. And it's very difficult to predict precisely how long that's going to go on because things are evolving so rapidly at the moment. How are prices, you know, uh, of the sweeteners compared to the sugar? And if they're higher, does it mean that because of these price pressures and, you know, global recessionary concerns, that certain companies are reluctant to do the switch? So we're not, we're not seeing any slowdown in demand for, for what we do. Um, you know, our new products, which is where a lot of that um, shift comes from grew by 35% last year. And the other thing we focus on when we when we see a recessionary environment coming is helping our customers, you know, for, if you like value engineer products. So there's a way of reducing right. the cost of products by simplifying formulations. And, and through the pandemic, we saw that as well. And we, we successfully grew. So we have to balance our innovation efforts to focus on both and support our customers in both areas. So creating healthier products, but also making them yeah. more value value-oriented for, for consumers. So where's the biggest demand coming from in terms of products, but also regions? So we, encouragingly, last year, we saw double-digit growth across all of our regions. You know, we saw good recovery in North America and Europe as we came out of the pandemic, and the faster-growing markets in growth markets grew very well. Um, in terms of products, we're seeing, uh, you know, very strong demand for sweeteners, you know, especially our stevia business, which over doubled last year. We're seeing very strong demand for dietary fibers as consumers have become increasingly conscious about the need for extra fibers in their diet. And, you know, as part of that drive, we just announced today the completion of an acquisition in China of a dietary fibers business, which exposes us not just more to dietary fibers, which is growing, mm -hmm. but also to China, which is clearly a big growth market for us for the future. Nick Hampton, thank you so much for joining us, the chief executive there of Tate and Lyle. Well, Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition continues in the next hour. Matt Miller, Kaylee Lines in New York, Anna Edwards in London. Happy Thursday, ECB Day. We'll see whether they discuss and deal with European fragmentation. This is Bloomberg. settled into a, a little bit of fatigue. This market has 
obviously pose some unique challenges. There is more and more evidence building that maybe we are starting to see peak inflation. The global economy is, is paying a very hefty price for the uh, war that Russia is leading into Ukraine. It's time to sit and watch and wait. And essentially, that's the position that the ECB and the Bank of Japan have taken. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Anna Edwards, Matt Miller and Kaylee Lines. It's 10 a.m. in London, 5 a.m. in New York and 5 p.m. in Hong Kong on this Thursday, June 9th. Our top stories today. The ECB's set to pave the way for its first interest rate hike in more than a decade. It's expected to announce an imminent end to large-scale asset purchases later today. President Biden calls inflation the bane of the U.S. ARK investment chief Kathy Wood, though, says the huge inventories held by American companies suggest that inflation will die down. And Credit Suisse is tapping the brakes on its plan to expand in China. Shares of the bank drop again. State Street says it won't respond to news reports that it's looking to buy the Swiss bank and is focused on other pending acquisitions. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Matt Miller and Kaylee Lines over in New York. And we're waiting for the ECB then, Kaylee. A lot of focus here in Europe on the ECB. European stocks, though, losing a little bit of ground as we uh, work our way toward that important meeting. Well, and we saw stocks losing some ground in Asia overnight as well. And broadly, a down day for Asian stocks. We had the MSCI Asia Pacific Index uh, lower by a few tenths of 1%, a drag really created by China with the CSI 300 there down a full percentage point. Now, on the one hand, you did have better trade data, export data for May. The question is what demand is going to look like going forward as some companies are reporting that orders are dropping as consumers shift from uh, goods to services. And of course, you also had uh, news that Shanghai is going to lock down part of the city over the weekend for testing. So COVID zero remains a headwind. Of course, the other story we've been following in Asia over the last several days is the weakness of the Japanese yen. Dollar yen went out to a 134 handle yesterday, though the yen is gaining a bit of strength back today. We're at 133.70, but still that is right around the weakest level in 20 years as the Bank of Japan keeps that yield target, wants to keep policy easy at a time when pretty much everyone else is tightening, including the RBNZ in New Zealand. It outlaid its plans uh, for QT overnight. That will begin next month. As a result, you have the 10-year in New Zealand at a seven-year high up about nine basis points. Now, one other bit of news that crossed right after the Asian session uh, closed about 10, 15 minutes ago is out of China. China regulators reportedly are considering reviving Ant's IPO. Ant, of course, the financial giant controlled by Alibaba's Jack Ma. Alibaba ADRs and pre-market here in the U.S., Matt, up more than 6% on that news. Yeah, and that's got to be a, a little bit of positive sentiment for futures this morning. We're seeing gains today. We didn't see gains at the close yesterday. You know, we've had a couple of very twisty days with deep red opens and, and positive closes or vice versa. Yesterday, we uh, closed down still more than 1% in the cash trade. So snapping a two-day decline, a little bit of a bounce maybe, um, but also uh, positive sentiment from the Alibaba possibility, the potential IPO. You do see investors, though, buying the 10-year yield, or, sorry, buying the 10-year um, treasuries, pushing the yield down, I should say, but still over 3%, three spot 0178 right now. And when we've seen treasuries, um, the yield over 3%, we've really seen a lot of pressure on equity. So keep in mind that um, inverse correlation. Right now, NYMEX crude is little changed, but at 121.97, Texas Intermediate is very expensive. And obviously the global benchmark Brent is trading for a little bit more right now. And Bitcoin, as usual lately, nothing doing. I mean, it's up 1% from midnight, but still at 30,000 and change, 30,465. So continues to be stuck in that range. Mm -hmm. Anna, you see some red over in Europe. Yeah, we do see some red here in Europe. So those higher interest rate, uh, those higher uh, debt yields, uh, a factor, higher inflation expectations, higher commodity prices, all that very much in the mix as we wait for the ECB uh, and not really taking our lead from U U.S. futures, interestingly. So stuck in a rut here, really, in Europe, down three tenths of a percent in London, four tenths of a percent to, uh, to moving lower on the Zetra DAX. So we've got weakness here. There is some positivity around some of those energy names with Brent, yes, falling today, but up with $123 as the handle on the Brent price. Uh, that is, of course, 
course, relative to history, a high price for oil. So that's the picture on the map. One of the sectors that is uh, not doing quite that is not doing quite so well is is financial <coughs> services, and that was weighed down by Credit Suisse. Although we do see that stock just jumping into positive territory, literally just in the ten min for last ten minutes or so, as we said in our headlines, it had been under pressure in the first couple of hours of trade here, as we'd heard those comments from State Street. Well, they didn't want to comment, but they did point towards the fact they were focused on acquisitions elsewhere. EDF, the uh, Electricity de France, uh, energy business over in France, is more than 80% owned by the French government. A newspaper in France talking about whether full nationalization is coming for this business, and the stock is up by 6.5% as a result. This is the one-day move in natural gas prices here in the UK, 23% higher. We've been up by more than 30% earlier on in the session. The European benchmark also up, not by as much, but also moving higher. And this has to do with that, uh, that explosion at a, uh, uh, an export facility, an LNG export facility in Texas. As a result, uh, gas being trapped in the United States weighs on U.S. prices, can't get to Europe. That pushes up the European prices at a time when Europe is, of course, increasingly reliant on the U.S. and others uh, as it tries to replace gas flows from Russia. This is Euro-Yen. We're working our way towards the ECB meeting, Kaylee, of course, and a lot of people will focus on Euro-Dollar. How hawkish will the ECB be? And, of course, the yen has been really weak of late, even if the yen is actually bouncing a little bit this morning. Uh, so I just put in Euro-Yen as this could be a pair to watch whilst we uh, focus on the ECB and uh, I was going to say Frankfurt, but they're not in Frankfurt, they're in Amsterdam. Yep, changing locations for today, Anna. That is definitely something we will be watching in the day ahead. There's also some other things that we should be paying attention to, including President Biden attending and delivering remarks at the opening plenary of the ninth summit of the Americas that's out on the West Coast. Then Boris Johnson will promise to reform the UK housing market in his first big policy speech since narrowly winning a vote on his leadership. And finally, as Anna mentioned, we will be getting that ECB rate decision. That is at 7.45 a.m. New York time. Matt, I cannot wait. Yeah, paying very close attention, although we don't expect any change to the rate. We should hear um, uh, about the end of the asset purchase program or at least winding that down and then get a clue as to the coming rate hikes in July and September. Of course, they take an August holiday like most civilized people. The ECB <laughs> then set to announce an imminent end to the APP. We spoke to Christine Lagarde exclusively at Davos last month where she made it clear she isn't in a rush. We are not in a, in a, a panic mode. And we've started that journey, thinking about it very carefully, back in December, with steps along the way. And we are now at a stage where there is um, every certainty that we will stop net asset purchases uh, very early in, uh, in July. Let's get more with our European correspondent, Maria Tadeo, who's been covering the ECB for years in Frankfurt. And thankfully, this time, you're in Amsterdam, Maria. Yes, Matt, we're in Amsterdam, you have the little boat, you have the canal, some will say this is the most cliched shot of Amsterdam, but I like to think of it as a tribute uh, to this beautiful city, but, you know, I think location changes, but nonetheless, Matt, the focus is the same, it really is about inflation inflation, as you said there, we're not expecting policy changes today, but this is a press conference that is really worth watching over two things, we're going to get confirmation the asset purchases are coming to an end in the next few weeks, and that, of course, will open now and pave the way for the first rate hike, this is in July. The market is very well priced in on that and well calibrated. The question is, and this to me really is the key point today, is Madame Lagarde going to stay fixed on the 25 basis points or actually does she signal perhaps a more hawkish tilt now, potentially 50 basis points uh, to come? The other thing to me that's important in this press conference particularly mm -hmm. will be the language around fragmentation. The more you normalize policy, the more you take rates higher, you could see that volatility in the bond market. We already see it play out in BTPs, is she going to talk about fragmentation, the risk of it, particularly, as I say, when you look at the Italian bond market, and is the ECB ready to provide some buffer on that front? And not just as an abstract concept, but perhaps even pointing now to an actual tool that would deal with those spillover effects from the rate path. So I think to me, it's those two things. Do we hover around 25 or 50? And what does she do if we see spreads once again jump in across the euro area? Maria Tadeo in Amsterdam. Thank you, Vel. Thank you very much for mm. reporting uh, on the road with the ECB. Now, investor Kathy Wood says the massive inventories now held by U.S. companies suggest that inflation will die down in the U.S. She spoke exclusively to Bloomberg's Ed Ludlow at the UP Summit. As I've said many times, we think the greatest risk, greater risk by far is deflation. Deflation cyclically, 
But you're because talking over a longer time horizon. I'm talking about now, too, because I think this inventory issue highlights the cyclical reason we've been saying we think inflation will unravel. The secular deflation story is very powerful. Let's get more on this then with Bloomberg's Danny Berger. Really interesting commentary there. And inventories is something we've been looking at when it comes to U.S. retail, certainly yeah. for a while. Yeah, really fantastic interview by Ed there. Yes, it is something we've been looking at. Of course, it's important to note that Kathy Wood is talking her book to some extent, not perhaps to some extent, to a large extent. She owns a lot of tech. ARC has fallen 50% this year. If we went away from inflation, didn't have these rate hikes or even cuts down the road, that would certainly help her portfolio. But Anna, you're right. This issue of a retailer inventory glut is something that a lot of people have been concerned about. Markets have been concerned about. When we've heard from Walmart, Target, all the likes talking about this huge buildup of inventory, it's really been enough to spark markets moving lower. Now, uh, BI estimates show that the amount of inventories as a proportion of sales is the highest since data going back to 2007. Because these retailers, due to COVID issues, supply chain issues, and demand, put a lot of inventory uh, in their warehouses. So the concern is, if it's building up now, does that mean you have a consumer who's spending less because inflation is biting? Of course, the other possibility is that we're just spending on services. We're not spending on goods as much even anymore. That's why tomorrow's figure of CPI, seeing the breakdown of goods and services and whether services has stayed elevated is going to be really important, Kaylee. Absolutely. We're looking forward to that print at 8.30 a.m. New York time tomorrow. Bloomberg's Danny Berger, thank you so much. And while we're talking inflation, we know that it's something that has dogged President Joe Biden for some time. He talked about that last night on a show hosted by Jimmy Kimmel. Look, Inflation is the, is, is, the, is the bane of our existence. Inflation is mostly in food and in at gasoline at, yeah. at the pump. Jack Fitzpatrick, Bloomberg government reporter, joins us now from D.C. The bane of our existence, Jack, pretty strong language, and yet that probably is true for the president and the Democratic Party as we draw closer to the midterms. Yeah, beyond the economic effects, it's, it's clearly a political bane of the president's existence. And he's made it clear that he understands the amount of blowback coming his way and has talked uh, quite a bit about the limits of his own powers to address inflation in the immediate term. You've heard him talk a lot more about reducing the deficit from the recent highs. That it was pretty newsworthy that he specifically said uh, trying to lower prescription drug costs is one thing they can do. That's not an immediate panacea, but that is part of the sort of remnants of the Build Back Better so-called legislative uh, package that may still be alive. Something along the lines of prescription drug costs, changing the tax code, and maybe an environmental and energy portion is what they're still talking about now and then. Uh, so the, that if it's a possibility that the inflation political pressure on the president moves things forward on those issues. Again, that's not an immediate fix to inflation, but it would be quite significant if there's a lot of pressure to take some sort of action uh, to do something on prescription drugs. Inflation, you know, Reagan said inflation is as violent as a mugger, as frightening as an armed robber, and as deadly as a hitman. Um, but guns are the number one killer of children in this country these days. President Biden also spoke about gun control on Kimmel. Where do we stand on the negotiations in Congress? Yeah, I, you know, it was interesting that uh, Jimmy Kimmel, of all people, a late night talk show host, did seem pretty determined to press the president and ask some tough questions and pressed him on why he can't do more through executive orders. Uh, Biden pushed back a bit on that and said that his legal abilities are limited. Uh, but there are still talks going on in the Senate in particular uh, that look somewhat promising, but very limited. They're talking about things like red flag laws, shoring up back background checks, especially uh, for people under 21, uh, younger people who may have some things in their background that were expunged. The House actually voted on a more ambitious bill just yesterday uh, and passed it almost exactly along party lines, very little crossover. That got into raising the age on uh, some purchase of, of most semi-automatic weapons to 21. Uh, but again, there were only five Republicans who crossed over in the House. It's not the kind of thing that would have a great time in the Senate. So we're still looking to the Senate uh, in the behind the scenes talks they're having on something slimmed down uh, and they they are still hopeful that they can come to some very uh, modest proposal that could get 60 votes in the Senate.
All right, Jack, thanks very much. Bloomberg's Jack Fitzpatrick there reporting on um, the White House facing inflation and gun violence. Now, Credit Suisse is tapping the brakes on its China expansion and postponing its biggest mainland, mainland project there. Bloomberg's learned the Swiss lender has delayed the launch of its locally incorporated bank by a year to 2024. This comes uh, amid the real news that we all care about when it comes to Credit Suisse. Is State Street going to buy it or not? State Street um, didn't want to make a comment. Our global finance correspondent, Shanali Basic, joins us. So what's the latest with the possibility of Credit Suisse getting taken out? Well, look no further than State Street's stock price yesterday after this rumor was leaked. The idea that it fell more than 5% in the stock market. A lot of skepticism from sell-side analysts that this is a deal that would make sense for State Street, partially given the size, but also because of the business mix and regulatory hurdles that they may face. Now, would a smaller deal make sense? Typically, when we've seen these deals be talked about before, there has been conversations. Think about what happened with Deutsche Bank a couple of years ago. Conversations about not a full-scale takeover, but are there pieces like the asset manager that could be acquired? Uh, these rumors have been perennial. For I've been here nine years, and these rumors have existed as long as that. So uh, it's mm. fair to say that there are reasons for skepticism for a deal of this size, but there is a broader question. Is it time? Is now the time with depressed valuations for finally yeah. European banking mergers? And Janali, we're just seeing uh, Credit Suisse's CEO, Thomas Gottstein, speaking at a Goldman conference, actually, and he's saying the strategy execution is on track. We'll keep an eye on what else he has to say this morning. Now, uh, on to other news that I know you've been following very closely. SEC Chief Gary Gensler has been laying out his vision for revamping stock market rules. He wants them to be more favorable or more fair, in his view, for retail investors. What's his argument? Yeah, the, the landmine here is really the idea of changing payment for order flow, which obviously has been uh, touted as a way to really improve execution for retail traders, leveling the playing field. And he's saying now that the playing field really isn't very level at all. He wants his staff to consider creating an order-by-order -order auction mechanism. Now, right now, the main way of competing with payment for order flow is internalization. What market participants are really asking the SEC to do is create a lot of disclosure here about the true price improvement for investors. Bloomberg Intelligence's Larry Tabbs says the current system allows investors to capture 38, almost 40 percent of the spread under the current mechanism. So can the SEC's changes really make life better for retail investors? Mm. The data still needs to show it. Okay, Shanali, thanks so much. Bloomberg's Shanali Basak with the latest on a couple of really interesting news items from the world of finance. Coming up, we'll get back to the European economy. Jens Eisenschmidt joins us. Morgan Stanley, chief European economist, will put Europe front and center because of the ECB meeting taking place today. How will they lay the groundwork for a hike in July and how big will that hike be? Plus, uh, the Lord of Lanai, Oracle billionaire Larry Ellison is making his Hawaiian island more hospitable to the super rich, apparently, and pushing out families that have been there for generations. Me, read more on that story by typing NI Big Take into your terminal. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Here's what you need to know. The ECB is set to pave the way for its first interest rate hike in more than a decade. It's expected to announce an imminent end to large-scale asset purchases later today. Officials are trying to tame record inflation while averting further damage to an economy bruised by the war in Ukraine. President Biden calls inflation the bane of the U.S. Arc Investment Chief Kathy Wood says the huge inventories held by American companies suggest that inflation will die down. And Credit Suisse is tapping the brakes on its plan to expand in China. Shares of the Swiss bank drop again. State Street says it won't respond to news reports that it's looking at buying Credit Suisse and is focused on other pending acquisitions. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Matt Miller and Kaylee Lines in New York. Uh, Matt, we've got European equity markets looking a little vulnerable this morning as we wait for the ECB. Yeah, and uh, U.S. equity indexes um, finished the day lower yesterday, so maybe what we're seeing today is a little bit of a bounce, although Kaylee brought us the uh, good news, po potential good news on Alibaba. Um, when Chinese tech stocks get a little bit of a lift, that makes um, U.S. futures investors a little bit more optimistic. So maybe that's part of the three-tenths percent gain that we're seeing here. Not a huge thing, but still green on the screen. Investors are also buying uh, a, a 
uh, bonds, though, pushing the yield lower right now. It's still over 3%, 3.0197% on the 10-year and not really a lot of move in the yield, um, but the level, I think, is notable. The level on crude kind of takes your breath away, right? Texas Intermediate trading for 122.02. Feels like 2008 again. Um, we're actually down right now to that level. So it's pretty amazing. Um, and that has its consequences. That's part of the bane of the US that President Biden was talking about. Bitcoin right now, um, it's up one and a third percent, but still holding at 30,582. At some point, I'm just gonna take this off the board because Kaylee, it doesn't <laughs> really change. It's been stuck around that level for weeks now, Matt, so it hasn't been all too exciting. Now, as you mentioned, I am following a couple pieces of news out of China that are reflected in the pre-market action in the U.S. this morning. One is actually related to Tesla's factory in China, in Shanghai. It saw production triple in May, producing more than 33,000 cars, so that really shows how production roared back after it struggled with those COVID related lockdowns that is lifting Tesla shares in early hours by about three percentage points. Now the other piece of news and Matt, you hinted at this relates uh, to China's maybe easing regulatory crackdown. The news that came out earlier uh, about an hour ago or so was that China regulators are now looking reconsidering Ant Group's IPO and of course the financial company controlled by Jack Ma of Alibaba. You are seeing that reflected in Alibaba ADRs uh, before the bell. They're up about three and a half percent and in other Chinese technology stocks, uh, U.S. listings as well. Didi is up a little more than six percent and Baidu getting a little bit of a lift up about 1.4 percent before the bell, Anna. Kaylee, European equity markets then on the back foot this morning, a little bit weaker, down by half a percent, not really being lifted in terms of sentiment by what we're seeing in U.S. futures this morning. Part of that is weakness in financial services and Credit Suisse is down again, down 2%. Yesterday, we were talking at this time of day about a weaker share price for Credit Suisse after they produced a profit warning. Then later in the day, of course, there was that uh, speculation in, 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 in one particular web, uh, website that was talking about whether we might see a bid coming through from State Street. They didn't want to comment but pointed to other M&A that they're doing and so the Credit Suisse uh, share price falls as a result. Uh, what is not falling is natural gas prices here in Europe. This is the UK benchmark up by 1.22% uh, this morning. It's been up uh, more than 30% earlier on. We saw that fire in the refiner in the uh, sort of uh, in the export terminal for LNG that Kaylee was referencing earlier on in the program. And that, of course, keeps LNG in the United States, stops it getting to Europe and pushes up prices here in Europe. And I put in Euro Yen, Matt, because I know we're going to talk about the ECB next and some who are watching the FX markets as we work our way towards the uh, ECB's meeting, tell me that this could be interesting. Uh, there's been a lot of focus on that. How hawkish, of course, will the ECB be? And also a lot of focus on just how weak the yen has been of late, even if it's actually bouncing a little against the dollar and the euro today. That used to be Tom Keane's favorite currency pair. I think now it may be <laughs> Aussie Let's hope dollar. it still is. I think it might be Aussie dollar yen or CAD yen. <laughs> Uh, maybe. In any case, um, very interesting to watch, and it'll be interesting to hear what Christine Lagarde has to say um, in the meeting today if they don't do anything with rates. They're not expected to. Um, but the debate right now is do they go 25 or 50? The Hawks seem to be gaining a little bit of momentum. And if you look at the charts, the ECB is just almost staggeringly um, behind what you see at the BOE and the ECB. So very interesting uh, meeting today. Jens Eisenschmidt, Morgan Stanley Chief European Economist, joins us now. Jens, what do you expect um, from Christine Lagarde and co? And why aren't they in more of a rush to try and slow the highest inflation ever recorded in the European Union? Hello, uh, thank you, thank you. First of all, thank you for having me here. And um, indeed, uh, just to sort of highlight, um, this will be a very important meeting uh, for the ECB. Uh, it is the meeting um, in which they are set to um, announce the end of their asset purchases. Um, we expect this end uh, to be, in fact, a little bit uh, anticipated to uh, the end of June. So basically, they will be, according to our expectations, saying um, they will end asset purchases in Q2. Um, and then uh, we expect, uh, as, as probably many do, and as also the president herself ha has uh, lined out in a blog post uh, just uh, two weeks ago, mm. um, 25 basis points in July and 25 basis points uh, in September. And here, I think the uh, idea is really to leave behind uh, two of the extraordinary 
policy measures that are meant for a time or were designed in a time in which inflation was undershooting consistently yeah. uh, their target, uh, to leave them behind. Um, and then uh, I think we are talking about a different setup once we have left these behind. Okay, so they're wanting to move on and get us to a new phase then, I suppose, Jens. Uh, you, your, your focus is on the European economy. And so, uh, so I wonder, with that in mind, how long is there for hiking for the ECB? Because if they're late to it versus other central banks globally, um, how long will they have to hike? Because there are a lot of people thinking about when we might see recession in the Eurozone. Right. No, I think this is uh, a fair question. And I don't think, um, I mean, we expect no a recession at, at this stage. So yeah. we, our baseline uh, expectation is for 2.6%, which is pretty much what everybody else is expecting, a little bit below maybe. Um, certainly below what we think the ECB will be today saying that growth will come in for 22. But that's a very weak growth profile. That's a growth profile that's actually below potential. And in some sense, it's adding to slack. So uh, from that front, at least, um, we, we don't see additional um, inflation coming. Now, uh, there are downside risks to that profile significant ones like you know the downside risks are, are well known this is Ukraine yes. this is uh, COVID in China or COVID policies in China so supply chain issues uh, plus uh, maybe a less than uh, softish landing uh, in the US okay. for external demand okay and so we see inflation an issue clearly they want to tackle that but growth also on their minds um, where does that where does that leave the ECB then in terms of the communication it wants to get across today do you think they want to be hawkish to be seen to be hawkish or, or are they happy with where the market is priced at this point? So my sense is, and that I think sense has crystallized uh, following the communication out of the April meeting, which I think in spirit was a different one. And then in the two, three weeks after the April meeting, uh, we have seen lots of comments from governing council member. Uh, we have seen lots of interventions also out of the executive board, um, all agreeing that actually the time has now come to leave these two super loose policy tools behind uh, in a view or with a view to say uh, we have reached our aim, mm. namely stabilizing inflation more or less at 2%, maybe they will today say a little bit above 2% uh, over the medium term, which is an important thing. And uh, then uh, a different discussion is what to do afterwards. So I think everybody is happy, uh, that would be my sense, that they are able to exit the super accommodative monetary policy. Okay. Uh, the thing that unites the two, your question on um, recession risk or weak economic activity uh, versus inflation. I don't think that's necessarily uh, either or. It's something that over the medium term, what you're interested in is the stability. And the stability, mm -hmm. essentially, uh, you will get also out of, say, a lower economic activity that won't fuel inflation as much. OK, Kaylee, jump in. Yeah, Jens, to that point on kind of the balance between growth and inflation, the euro obviously is not quite as close to parity with the dollar as it was about a month ago, but still at a 107 handle, it's quite weak. Would a hawkish ECB bring a stronger or weaker euro, considering if they're too aggressive, then that is a greater threat to growth in theory? Right. Uh, I think here uh, you have to see that uh, market pricing currently is, from our perspective, pretty hawkish. I mean, just to sort of remind you our perspective is there will be three hikes this year then the impeding weakness in growth that will be in our view concentrated around the end of the year and the beginning of next uh, will make the ECB stop mind you with 25 basis points what we currently see as the the end in December uh, they are still very accommodative and they would be supporting the economy going through a weak patch and then uh, in September they would resume hiking now the market pricing is entirely different. Markets are very aggressive. And uh, to the extent that the ECB manages today to be even more aggressive than that, uh, that, of course, uh, could be, uh, you know, could lead to some movements in the currency pair. But I would rather think, uh, if anything, uh, it will be uh, not, not a material change to, to these expectations. Because essentially today what we are going to see is maybe the jump to June, what I said before. So basically ending asset purchases in June. And then hinting towards the path that the president already outlined in the block uh, without necessarily pre-committing to any of these steps, whether it's 25 or 50. Okay, Jens, thank you very much for the preview. Jens Eisenschmidt, uh, Morgan Stanley's chief European economist, joining us on set here in London. Now, coming up on the program, overhaul at the SEC. We'll dive into Gary Gensler's vision for revamping stock market rules next. This is Bloomberg.
This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. You're looking live at the principal room. Coming up later today, Nobel Laureate and former World Bank Chief Economist Paul Romer. That's at 12 p.m. in New York, 5 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. Right now, you see there is not a level playing field amongst the different parts of the markets, the wholesalers, the dark pools, the lit exchanges. It's not clear with such market segmentation and concentration, and yes, with an uneven playing field, that our current national market system is as fair and as competitive as possible for investors. SEC Chairman Gary Gensler speaking yesterday. The SEC, of course, has previewed sweeping changes to rules underpinning the U.S. stock market, including payment for order flow. Gensler says retail investors deserve a better deal, and it appears to be the agency's most direct response yet to last year's wild trading in so-called meme stocks. Bloomberg Opinion columnist Marcus, Athworth, Marcus Ashworth joins us now to discuss. So Marcus, she calls it, Marcus, he calls it a better deal, if they end up having to actually pay fees for trades rather than getting them for free, potentially with worse execution, how is that a better deal? Well, I think no one knows what the right answer here. And what Gens is doing here, which I applaud actually, it's a real sort of tough love, is sort yourselves out. Here's what I'm going to do if you don't get your act together and come up with something better, which works for everyone. Because it's more about suspicion. No one can really put a finger on whether payment for order flow is bad, illegal, uh, unfair. It's there's a huge suspicion around it that it might be. And in certain circumstances, almost certainly is. And it's just the whole system isn't doing itself any favors and it needs to clean its act up. But it, it's sort of, if you want to self-regulate in effect, then come up with much better regulations that suit you and doesn't evidently put the risk of retail trades at, 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 uh, you know, at some form of unfair advantage. Because it's so obvious putting it through market makers rather than direct on the exchanges that there is a lack of visibility what's going on. And I think that's what Gensler wants. More visibility and hopefully not worse uh, costs or, or, or indeed uh, right. execution. But the, but, the, but the key is no one really knows. I mean, if you read Matt Levine's columns, which I think we all um, really enjoy, um, it seems like payment for order flow could give retail investors a better deal, but it's not popular, as we saw um, during the uh, hearings um, uh, when Ken Griffith and, and, uh, and Robin Hood were all sort of taken to task, especially by Democrats. Is, are we seeing a populist move by the head of the SEC? Is that what this is? Well, it can, it, I think it is. Both that and, and also it's sort of the right thing to do. Unless the market makers and the big firms, you know, Virtue, Citadel, et cetera, as you listed, cannot, if they can't prove that, that they're not doing something which isn't disadvantaging, then they can't, you know, they, they can't really have a leg to stand on here. So they have to up their game and, and perhaps show some visibility, which they clearly don't want to, but that doesn't mean they oughtn't to. And I think that's what Gensler's job is, is he's got a big stick here with a small carrot and he's trying to help people to take the carrot and help themselves. I applaud okay. it. Yeah, look, as long as he doesn't really, get it wrong. Yeah. <laughs> really interesting. Well, we'll see what the industry comes up with then, if that's uh, what's playing out here then, Marcus. On another uh, story that I know you've been focused on uh, very closely, Credit Suisse, uh, and of course, will there or won't there be an offer for them, State Street? There was a report yesterday that State Street might be interested. The Credit Suisse CEO declining to comment on State Street rumours, as you might expect. What was your take? I just think, I mean, how can I say this is complete rubbish without, without ruling out the possibility I might be wrong? You know, I cannot see <laughs> why on earth State Street would want to buy Credit Suisse. I can see absolutely why Credit Suisse wouldn't want to be bought out by State Street and or indeed the Swiss government allow it. But, you know, they're not two completely different types of organisations. There's no real compatibility. Now, it's possible that elements of Credit Suisse, uh, some of the American operations, asset management possibly might fit in nicely to an overall State Street, uh, you know, which is a huge organization. Um, but I just can't see it happening. I, I just don't think cross-border bank mergers in Europe, including Switzerland in Europe here, ever really work. And I can't see why this one makes any commercial sense for either side. 
Mm, that's interesting. And taking the sector as a whole, a, a number of guests saying to me that perhaps some of the Basel changes we've seen recently might make them more likely, but we'll bear your thoughts in mind. Uh, Marcus, thank you so much for joining us. Bloomberg Opinions, Marcus Ashworth with us to talk about uh, a couple of themes in finance. Coming up on this programme, could deflation be the greater risk? That's the warning from ARK Investment Management CEO Kathy Wood, part of our exclusive interview next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Matt Miller with Kaylee Lyons in New York and Anna Edwards in London. Now, ARK Investment Management CEO Kathy Wood says that massive inventories now held by U.S. retailers suggest that inflation will die down. In fact, she warned against deflation in an exclusive interview with Bloomberg's Ed Ludlow at the UP Summit in Bentonville, Arkansas. If you look at uh, our, our performance, our flagship's performance, from the low in COVID to the peak in February of 21, that was 360% increase. Innovation solves problems. We had a lot of problems through the coronavirus. Innovation solves problems. We were rewarded accordingly. Since then, peak to trough, when we hit our trough, thank goodness we're past it, down 75%. Why? Inflation and interest rates. So there is this... And it's really interesting to be here, um, Walmart territory, because I think we're learning a lot from the retailers now. And we're talking about what we learned about inventories. Inventories, right. yes. Uh, so uh, the fear of rising interest rates uh, and inflation out of control has gripped the market. And of course, and, and that's the equity market. If you look at the fixed income market, it does not agree with this. Yeah. The three-year, I mean, the 10-year Treasury bond yield is 3%. Uh, that, that instrument should be one of the most responsive to inflation fears, right? So 3%, which suggests GDP growth 3 to 4% during the next 10 years. So it's not being corroborated by the fixed income markets. And I don't think... I don't think that we are in an, a period where we can't extricate ourselves from this. In fact, the inventory stories are a very good example of why, of why inflation has become a problem. You know, the scrambling to bring more and more inventory to satisfy demand, stay-at-home demand, went into overdrive. And I believe the narrative in the last year, inflation... Uh, gave purchasing managers this idea that, okay, what's the worst that could happen if I build inventories? The worst that could happen is that I'm able to deliver inventory profits, sell at a higher price. Well, that's not going to happen. That's not going to happen. When we see, I've never seen inventory um, uh, surges like this in my career, and I've been around for a long time. So 33% uh, at Walmart, 42% uh, at uh, at Target, 74% uh, at, uh, no, 50% at Kohl's. So very broad-based. Uh, and so I think we're going to see a lot of discounting. And, this, and what's beginning to happen now, just at the margin, uh, and we're seeing it because our strategy is now starting to outperform uh, the, the rest of the market. I've never been in a market where the market has gone to new highs and we are hitting lows. I've never been in a market. So there's been, a, and it hasn't been supported by the fixed income market. So we'll see what happens. Uh, Kathy Wood there speaking exclusively with Bloomberg's Ed Ludlow talking about inventory buildups at retailers, but not in the businesses that she owns, right? Certainly not at Tesla. There's no inventory at car makers. Um, but I guess uh, that wouldn't fit the narrative. Joining us now is Tom Keen, co anchor of Bloomberg Surveillance. Um, and typically you bring a chart of the day, Tom. I know you in the past have really cared about Euro Yen. Um, we're expecting to see uh, or hear something interesting from the ECB today. What are you focused on? Well, we're going to focus on the ECB. We're going to see the announcement at 745 Wall Street time and then on to the press conference. And I, I, I must say, this is a different ECB meeting. Am I going to be hanging on every word? No. But there will be times here where Christine Lagarde can really message the compromise she has to strike across a fractured uh, Europe. It's just going to be fascinating to see all in all. 
All right, I'm really, Tom, really looking forward to your breakdown of the decision and the guests you speak with uh, on surveillance later today. Tom Keen, co-anchor of Bloomberg Surveillance, thank you so much. Now, in addition to the ECB, what else are we paying attention to today? I will be watching Chinese ADRs because we got news about an hour ago that China regulators are considering potentially allowing the Ant Group IPO to revive. And this was something market watchers had really been focused on as a sign that the worst of the crackdown is over. Maybe a bottom is in in Chinese technology stocks. You're definitely seeing those ADRs getting a lift in pre-market trading this morning, Matt. So definitely something to watch throughout the trading day. Yeah, I'll be watching um, banks. You know, we've been talking for years about the possibility of uh, a, a, a European, big European bank uh, M&A. We haven't seen any, but now we're looking at the possibility of State Street buying Credit Suisse. Neither of those banks would comment on the reports in the um, Swiss blog parade plots, but uh, it'll be interesting to see if anything comes of it. Right now, Credit Suisse shares are trading under mm. seven, and the offer was reportedly for nine. Anna? Yeah, we'll keep watching Credit Suisse then. We've seen that the CEO has been commenting just as we've been on air, hasn't he, uh, around various things, but not commenting on the potential for any deal, of course, as we might expect. I'll watch the ECB then. Uh, very much in focus is whether we get any suggestion that 50 is on the table for July or any pushback against that. Also think about fragmentation, fragmentation of bond markets as the PEP plan comes to an end, that bond buying program. What's happening to Italian spreads? How concerned, if at all, is the ECB about that? That's it for Early Edition. Surveillance is next.